Intuitive, empathic, pensive, and quietly charming, INFJs spend a great deal of time in their own minds, logically analyzing the world and people around them. INFJs have a knack for figuring out other people's feelings and motivations, even though they are rarely able to point to any hard facts to back up their hunches with, and this certainty extends to the larger, intangible, and abstract belief system that this personality type is known for embracing. Do you believe in the existence of extraterrestrials? While their empathy and emotional fluency drives them to seek out deep human connections, their dual nature will require them to have frequent isolation in order to process it. For all their skills at emotional resonance, INFJs are intensely private individuals who often feel like outcasts in the world of human interaction. You're my oldest friend. I'm your only friend. Thank you for that. Like all the videos in this series, I aim to get you inside your character's head in order to assist you in portraying fictional characters that feel real, identifiable, and organic by outlining each of the 16 Union personality archetypes. However, this will only give you an outline and a personality type does not a character make. Hopefully by the end of this video, you will better understand how the INFJ processes and values information and how this affects their behavior, decision-making, and communication style so that you can then add motivations, backstory, interests, relationships, and likely personality quirks to result in a more organically complete character that your audience will connect with. I'll give you the outline and then you can fill it in. If your INFJ character had a favorite saying, it would probably be, don't get angry, but seek to understand, or be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. They have a kind, soft-spoken nature and come across as genuine and friendly. INFJs enjoy playing the role of counselor and will happily allow others to bear their souls to them. You're among friends now, Hank. You can show off. However, this sharing relationship is rarely reciprocated. Intensely introverted, the INFJ will only share their inner thoughts and emotions with those in their immediate and closest social circle. It is not unusual for someone outside this circle who considers the INFJ a close friend to suddenly realize they know nothing about them. INFJs intuitively feel that everything is connected to everything else within a vast universal system and thus one cannot describe or fully understand one particular aspect of the system without referencing other parts. They are most comfortable seeing the world as an interconnected system that can only be understood as a whole. Trying to break down a complex system into its component parts without taking into account the greater perspective would feel alien and wrong to an INFJ. This results in a curious individual who will withdraw from stressful or novel situations after only a short amount of time in order to think about how this new experience fits into the greater universal system as a whole. However, once this process is complete, they can be capable of profound insights about others and about the world around them. Look around you! This is where the path of hatred has brought us! I don't think she's lying. I think that if you prepare people well enough to believe a lie, they will believe it as if it were true. You know, when I do this, bad things tend to happen. It's because you can't control it. It controls you. That's why we're here, Alex. That's why we're training. It is not our abilities that show what we truly are. It is our choices. Because of this extreme tendency to withdraw into themselves and to think up elaborate and delicious theories, INFJs will seek to develop a grand connected theory of how the world or a system works and will methodically work through every loophole, unintended consequence, and unexplored extrapolation until they are satisfied that every possible variant has been incorporated and connected to the theory's central trunk. A conspiracy wrapped in a plot inside a government agenda. Aryan, Baratheon, Stark, Tyrell. They're all just spokes on a wheel. This one's on top, then that one's on top, and on and on it spins, crushing those on the ground. 
Well, as far as brains go, I got the lion's share, but when it comes to brute strength... I'm afraid I'm at the shallow end of the gene pool. However, they then believe that they have merely observed the world and discovered this understanding when in fact they have built and contrived the theory themselves. Since they genuinely believe they are only seeing what is already there and not creating anything new, INFJs trust their own instincts above all else and can be stubbornly unwilling to consider others' opinions. Look at that. Believing that they have legitimately come to their conclusions through objective observation. In books it's written that a warrior will draw a burning sword from the fire. Stannis Baratheon, warrior of light, your sword awaits you. Since they are guided by what interests them and what they observe, they base their beliefs on how complete and intellectually tasty a theory is, not on whether it follows any moral guiding principles. This can lead to some oddly amoral conclusions that can cause those close to them to be taken aback. INFJs have a noted habit of making highly controversial or disturbing statements that insult others' sensibilities, as the INFJ has not felt through the implications of their ideas for themselves or for others, and is simply happy and excited to have found such a new, wonderfully complete and interesting theory to share. A lifetime of this repeated pattern of trying to share their inner thoughts and feelings in order to encourage deeper emotional connections, only to have those inner thoughts met with shock and disdain, continually reinforces to the INFJ that others cannot be trusted with their most vulnerable core. You are helping me show them to freedom. I wouldn't be here to help you if Ned Stark had done to me what you want to do to the masters of Yunkai. The INFJ will compensate for this by working very hard to fulfill the emotional needs of others while still protecting their own inner self. I'm sorry, Eric, but I've seen what Shaw did to you. I've felt your agony. I can help you. INFJs are almost always seen as the therapists of a group. They listen and give advice but the sharing relationship is distinctly one-sided. This learned reluctance to share their thoughts can take on a paranoid quality as they try and test any new individual to, in order to figure out if they will betray the INFJ in this way. I'm Dana Scully. I've been assigned to work with you. Oh, isn't it nice to be suddenly so highly regarded? So who did you take off to get stuck with this detail, Scully? Could you ever have faith in a man like that? I could never have faith in a man like Dario. Because INFJs are well aware that they are usually perceived as quiet and happily innocent, they take a perverse joy in using humor to shock those around them with their blunt challenges to what others hold dear. What did you say to him? I told him death by fire is the purest death. A favorite humorous tool of the INFJ is to point out the absurdity or nonsensical qualities of something everyone else takes for granted. How would you like a job where you get to keep your clothes on? Oh my god, Mulder. It smells like... I think it's bile. Is there any way I can get off my fingers quickly without betraying my cool exterior? Expect their humor to be dark, sarcastic, and often morbid, but delivered with a sweet and innocent disposition. The more outrageous a thing they say, the more stone-faced they will deliver it. Against our walls, you shall find no easy conquest here, Khaleesi. Good. My insulted need practice. I was told to blood them early. Life's not fair, is it? That the third floor corridor on the right hand side is out of bounds to everyone who does not wish to die a most painful death. 
You think that's air you're breathing now? As that for a magic trick? While they will regulate their humor for the social situation, the more comfortable the INFJ is with the people around them, the more their humor will cross all social and moral boundaries. I thought we might hit this little snag. You seem to be laboring under the delusion that I'm going to, what was the phrase? Come quietly. <gasps> you wouldn't shoot an unarmed man, would you, copper? But still I cannot see if the savage one is me. Most of their focus and enjoyment comes from analyzing the deeper meaning of whatever it is that interests them and from ensuring its internal logic, not from attempting to see their theories played out in the real world. In this way, they tend to be extreme perfectionists and have a habit of putting off important tasks until they are sure that they can get every detail exactly right. Since they are outwardly reserved, this will usually come across as laziness or disinterest. But once they are able to get some momentum, INFJs are capable of covering serious ground in a short amount of time. Their problem solving typically has a long end game in mind, will often include a large number of contingency plans, and will usually revolve around utilizing the individuals around them. They prefer to work on larger, grander problems rather than on smaller everyday ones. INFJs have an inherent distrust of the future and of the chaos that is the physical world and will spend a great deal of time analyzing and trying to factor in every possible outcome of a given situation so as best to prepare for an unknown future. I promise to protect them. I promise them that enemies would die screaming. How do I make starvation scream? Their focus will be on individual people and their motivations. Because of their emotional fluency, the INFJ will typically set long-term plans into motion by directing and encouraging and or manipulating the emotions of the individuals around them. Shut down the black markets, take away what little they have, then double the amount of floggings and executions, put them on TV, broadcast them live. So fear more fear and he's absolutely right it's far too dangerous only the bravest lions go there this is yours no it's ours they often struggle to pay attention to the real world around them withdrawing into deep contemplation for hours at a time then they may snap out of it and suddenly be surprised by something that everyone else noticed hours or days before as such, their perception of the physical world is unreliable. This can lead to frustrations for them and others when large pieces of data are left out of their theories because they withdrew into contemplation with only the limited data that first inspired them. Yes, Scar? Where is your hunting party? They're not doing their job. Scar, there is no food. The herds have moved on. No, you're just not looking hard enough. They are highly empathic towards others' emotions, and this can manifest in unhealthy levels where the INFJ will be overwhelmed with these emotions. So much pain. INFJs instinctively accommodate and mirror the emotions and behavior of those around them in order to best foster group harmony and to fulfill others' emotional needs. They will almost always strive to be kind to others, and this desire comes from their empathy and not from any internal set of values or principles. In other words, they are not kind because they believe being kind is the right thing to do regardless of the situation, but because they have empathized with others from listening and in many cases feeling what it is to walk in their shoes. In this way, their empathic understanding is somewhat removed. They will seek to understand how a person feels by imagining the circumstances that led the person to feeling that way, then applying those circumstances to themselves and imagining the resulting emotional outcome. She could have torn my head off, Scully, but she didn't because she sensed that I wasn't a threat. So yeah. This emotional role playing is how INFJs expand their emotional understanding of the world and inspire their own drive to better intellectually understand the world. And as frightening as it may be, 
that pain will make you stronger. If you allow yourself to feel it, embrace it, it will make you more powerful than you ever imagined. It's the greatest gift we have to bear their pain without breaking. This can, depending on who they're around, lead to a very one-dimensional understanding of the world or situation, which leads to a very deep sense of injustice and anger towards those who allowed the circumstances to happen. It's tempting to see your enemies as evil, all of them, but there's good and evil on both sides in every war ever fought. Let the priests argue over good and evil. Slavery is real. I can end it, I will end it, and I will end those behind it. Why, if it isn't my big brother descending from on high to mingle with the commoners? I, I, I think you're looking too hard, Scully, for something that's not there. I think that Michelle Charters concocted this story to get out of a job she hates. For the most part, the INFJ's empathetic approach to learning and exploring is generally welcome and encouraged by their community right up until the INFJ begins to sympathize with individuals who the community has shunned for clear moral reasons. The INFJ's logical and amoral approach to understanding and empathy can lead them down some disturbing paths, like defending the plight of serial murderers or pedophiles. It was the only way. You burnt a little girl alive. I only do what my lord commands. If he commands you to burn children, your lord is evil. We are standing here because of him. Immature INFJs make zero moral judgments about a situation and seek only to emotionally and logically understand what the other person has experienced. As the healthy INFJ matures and has the experience of emotionally mirroring greater numbers of people, they do tend to become individuals of high moral integrity and are usually the whistleblowers who expose the corruption and harmful wrongdoings of others thus protecting the integrity of the community at large. If you kill him, you'll have to kill me too. This is the path I choose, Father. What will yours be? INFJs favor a direct approach to their communication while preferring a more informative style from others. Because surface level or trivial information tends to bore them, they wish to get directly to the heart of the matter so they can more quickly begin to understand the greater system. Oh, really? I was under the impression that you were sent to spy on me. What you mean is, not like you. Thus, while they do tend to take an emotionally diplomatic approach towards communication, you can expect their speech patterns to show an economy of words in general and for them to refrain from expressing their own plans and emotions in particular. This is the revolution, and you are the Mockingjay. And we're on our way to District 13 right now. 13? Are you a good man, Sir Devis Seawood? We might need your help to stop them. Marvelous. So we're to be the CIA's new mutant division, yes? Something like that. Take off your clothes. INFJs carefully guard their inner emotional core. They are extremely sensitive towards what others think of them and are highly insecure about fitting in. And you lied. I didn't lie. I was wrong. I did not overreact. Ronnie Strickland was a vampire. Because when they do express their internal thought process, it often offends the sensibilities of others. And because they have a strong need to foster group harmony, they developed a learned tendency to not share their inner and vulnerable parts of themselves. And it wasn't until you were 12 that you realized all the voices were in everyone else's head. Do you want me to go on? I never told anyone that. This leads us to one of the greatest insecurities and fears of the INFJ, that they will never be understood and will always feel alone despite being surrounded by people they care for. You've come a long way, Mulder. Yeah, and still nobody believes me. Why should anyone follow me? You're a Targaryen. You're the mother of dragons. I need to be more than that. Respected, saluted, and seen for the wonder I am! 
Because INFJs wish to understand the exact way and method of getting through whatever problem or puzzle they are trying to solve, they will not be content to be handed shortcuts to the solution if they don't understand how it works. INFJs hate being asked to take someone's word for it. I despise guessing games. And can get very frustrated and even paranoid when they don't understand every reason or motivation behind another's actions or explanations. When an INFJ comes across an individual who is essentially an open book or exceptionally chatty and informative, this can spark an interest or at least an initial level of comfort around that individual, simply because knowing all the details about a thing makes the INFJ feel more secure about the thing. The INFJ villain will be driven by a deep sense of integrity that is unencumbered by any sense of morality. For the INFJ, particularly the young or immature INFJ, morality is something hazy and difficult to define. It could really be anything and it is highly malleable by external factors. The idea of a set and universal moral truth that does not bend to circumstances is something that the healthy INFJ does learn in time, but it is something that they must learn. What the INFJ is born with, however, is a strong sense of integrity. And injustice, the INFJ feels that once a person has discovered the correct thing to do, then they should do it regardless of their personal feelings about it or regardless of any larger implied ramifications because it is the right thing to do. But until they find a body, I'm not giving up on that girl. So they may feel very bad about all the collateral damage they're causing as they move toward their goals, but they're going to do it anyway because it's the right thing to do. This can make the healthy INFJ incredibly inspiring, but it can also make for some fantastically horrific antagonists. To fully utilize the potential horror of a well-actualized INFJ villain, all you really need to do is to deny them a fully rounded emotional education and then put them into an environment where any acts of atrocity needed to reach their end goals are, for whatever reason, tolerated. Sometimes it is better to answer injustice with mercy. I will answer injustice with justice. <laughs> Because INFJ's sense of morality comes from their own empathy and not from an internal set of guiding principles, what can essentially manifest is an individual who does the right thing for the wrong reasons. Add in their absolute certainty in whatever it is they are certain about. He is the one. Where's your God? Inside you. Well, maybe it was you who inspired me to come back. But Voldemort lives inside him. And you can end up with a highly driven antagonist whose mantra is, the ends justify the means. In other words, since what they are trying to achieve is good and just, any act of atrocity in the pursuit of that goal is also good and just, even if it is unfortunate. Thousands will die at your command. You will betray the man serving you. You will betray your family. You will betray everything you once held dear. And it will all be worth it. I feel I owe you an apology. We have a rule. We never free a mind once it's reached a certain age. It's dangerous. The mind has trouble letting go. I've seen it before and I'm sorry. We both want to help people. We can only help them from a position of strength. Sometimes strength is terrible. This can rather disturbingly be twisted into some unique and truly villainous tendencies buried within a lovable and cuddly character. One of my favorite examples of this logically amoral internal thought process can be easily seen in Dumbledore from the Harry Potter franchise. Heavy spoilers for the entire Harry Potter series will follow. Now, Dumbledore, from a structural standpoint, serves primarily as a mentor figure, guiding young Harry along his chosen one path. 
However, in the later books, his structural role switches to a minor antagonist. He's a supremely well-written and realized character whose moral ambiguity is both clearly shown and easily dismissed from the very first chapter of the very first book. Dumbledore, having gotten word that infant Harry defeated Voldemort, immediately chose to put the child into a home where he knew Harry would suffer physical and mental abuse. Do you really think it's safe? Leaving him with these people. I've watched them all day. They're the worst sort of muggles imaginable. He did this so that Harry wouldn't grow up with fame and would grow to be the kind of person who could eventually defeat Voldemort. But he still placed an orphan boy in an abusive home for the greater good. Also think about how easily this incredibly amoral decision was passed over by the other characters in the story and by the viewers. Because Dumbledore really is a genuinely caring, feeling, and warm individual. He doesn't have an ulterior motive like most villainous characters do, and that genuineness and certainty is readily accepted by others even in the face of obvious facts. Ironically, this decision wasn't challenged by the other characters in the story, specifically because Dumbledore has so many decades of faithful service under his belt. Those around him assumed he knew best, so none of them suggested putting baby Harry in a trusted foster home and changing the kid's name to protect his identity. Dumbledore kept an eye on Harry for all those years and knew the child was being abused, neglected, bullied, starved, and imprisoned, yet Dumbledore was so sure that all of this had to come about in order for the good and just end goal to be attained that he never put a stop to it. I forget how much you've grown. At times I still see the small boy from the cupboard. Dumbledore also takes advantage of Snape during Snape's emotional breakdown and expertly uses Snape's own moral code against him in order to turn Snape into Dumbledore's secret agent. Snape is blind to his own manipulation, but he does call Dumbledore out on his amoral strategy of using Harry as a means to an end. The boy must die. Yes. Yes. You've kept him alive so that he can die at the proper moment. You've been raising him like a pig for slaughter. Dumbledore makes decisions that make sense to him and doesn't put a whole lot of thought on whether they will make sense to others. This nearly undoes all his work when, in Book 7, he sends a trio of teenagers on a wild goose chase, grossly overestimating their ability to unravel the clues he left behind. Given how time-sensitive and important their task was, this was a huge miscalculation and grew out of the INFJ's learned tendency to think up elaborate plans and share the details with no one. Exactly because of the tendency for their ideas to be met with apprehension and disquiet. I'm probably going to upset a lot of people here because Dumbledore is such a beloved character, but in a way that's exactly my point. Good characters are not perfect, and neither was Dumbledore, but he was perfectly flawed in the sense that his flaws were internally logical and grounded in real-life patterns that we see in the world and instinctively connect with. Dumbledore was a flawed individual, but an exceptionally good character. Thank you for watching, and I hope you have found this video valuable. I'll be posting this series every Thursday, so if there is a personality type you'd like to see, let me know in the comments and I'll try to move it up in the schedule. Bring it on. After we get through all 16 archetypes, I'll be posting a few videos on how to determine which personality type would work best for your story, based on the type of story you are telling and what you need that particular character to do within the story. So hit the subscribe button if that's something you would like to see. Until then, thank you again and have a great day.